We're learning about a wonderful thing called grace. Yes. And what's wonderful about being in the family is that you give grace, you receive grace. Yes. And um, so I'm grateful that Father God is faithful and uh, he's our grand teacher. He sent us the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, direct us. And I don't know about you, but I don't know what I'd do without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I love the Holy Ghost. That's what our moderator says. And um, uh, so let's open up with prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come to you and we thank you for this day. We thank you that you brought us together here, Father. And, and Lord, we are grateful that you're going to do a good work in us and through us. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for pouring out of us. And we just give you the thanks and the praise as you bless this day, you bless this time. And we just ask that you just open, it, open us up so to receive of you. And we thank you our hearts are good soil to receive and that your word is great seed to be planted. And we thank you for what's going to grow out of it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Think of your fellow man. Lend him a helping hand. Put a little love in your heart. You see it's getting late, oh please don't hesitate, put a little love in your heart, and the world will be a better place, and the world will be a better place for you and me, you just wait and see. When you decide, kindness will be your guide. Put a little love in your heart, and the world will be a better place. And the world will be a better place for you and me. You just wait and see. just want to enter in day by day day by day day by day To see thee more clearly 
and love thee more dearly and follow thee more nearly day by day by day sing again day by day day by day It's good for us with a little gray hair on our head. Praise God. Show me your face. Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face. Good up my legs that I might stand in this hole. Show me your face, Lord, your power and your grace. I can make it to the end if I could just see. your hand over his face, so will your presence be for you die, and all of Israel saw the glory, and it shines down through the air, and now you call me to boldly Show me your face, good up my leg, and I might stand in this holy place. Show me your face, Lord, your power and your grace. We can Stand in this 
our imperfections and Lord will you take our brokenness and will you take our lives and as we lift them up to you incomplete without Jesus we're nothing without the love of God shed in our hearts we're nothing 
we lift to you, Lord God. A holy offering, our bodies, Lord God, that's holy and pleasing unto you. As you cleansed us, as you forgave us, as you're a God of second chances, we thank you, Father, that you brought us here today. And we lift our bodies up to you as a living sacrifice that's holy and pleasing unto you, all because of Jesus. To all of you out there in YouTube land, uh, welcome to Let Go and Soar Ministries uh, midweek uh, worship service. Uh, I'm Pastor Walt Scott, and uh, we have a great group here today. There's uh, three other pastors. No, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six other pastors out here in the audience. So I mean, like you're preaching to the choir, but <laughs> what can I say? It's uh, we have a lot of opinions, and uh, and. Uh, you know, opinions are like a lot of other things. Everybody's got at least one. So, uh, so I'm going to start with prayer. So, Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And we, th and we thank you, Jesus, for the gift of the Holy Spirit and your sacrifice on the cross just for us. Just so we would have opportunities like this to fellowship and, and come into relationship with, uh, with you and the Father. And Lord, we... We just invite you here today in a big way. We just invite your presence and your glory here in this place today, and uh, and we just we just we're just we're just uh, thankful to be alive and be able to do these things. And uh, so, Jesus, we just pray in your name, your precious name, Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to kind of lay a little foundation here about what I think is the most critical thing in relation to. Uh, pro-life, pro-choice pro, pro uh, movement. And I think that that's families. And uh, I don't know if anybody, most of you know that I, I wrote this book. This is the last book I just got through writing a few months ago and had it published. Uh, it's called We Can Love. It has a picture of Jesus holding a little child on the front. And I think it's real, you know, it fits, the, it fits this real well today, this message. So I'm going to read uh, a little bit out of chapter 9, which is called Families. And uh, and I'm going to do most of the scriptures myself today, just for the sake of time. But Kevin, normally we we uh, we have a board with all the scriptures written on it. We do, everybody goes around the room and reads the scriptures. But uh, uh, after I read this chapter and into the message, it might be a little stressed for time. So I'm just going to kind of uh, re read those myself today. So the first question is, who created family? God. Absolutely. I think we all know that God did starting with Adam and Eve and then the sons Cain, Abel, and Seth, right? Yes. Yeah. Ended up only being two sons. but So God created family in that deep love relationship specifically for us to be the relational glue that bonds us all together in our society and around the world. Also to give all the different people and cultures of this world something in common that we can all relate to so that we can be able to bond in unity. All the different nations in the world, we have that one thing in common, family. I believe he also created family because he wanted the relationship that family brings and to give us a taste of what family will be like in heaven when we are joined together with the family of God. And now comes the question, <clears throat> how has this family structure and bonding unit, unit, bonding unity fared over multiple generations in this world <clears throat> that we all live in? Yeah, what I wrote down, I said, do we see success or failure or something in between? I think we would have to agree on different levels of success or failure depending on what part of the world we were considering or living in, right? For my purpose here, I'm going to focus on the United States of America. Although I think that most modern industrial nations have experienced conditions similar to those of the United States. Similar. Not all of them. Similar. Our common enemy, Satan, has much success pulling families apart and or keeping them at odds with each other, right? 
It seems that many of the most selfish, vengeful, and violent acts perpetrated on people, by people on each other are within the family structure. And that's a fact. You just have to watch TV to see that. We need to look no further than TV or the newspaper for ver verification and examples of murder, sexual, mental, physical, and other types of abuse. Satan fosters deceit, hate, mistrust, resentment, offense, and unforgiveness because these are some of his favorite weapons. Right? Hmm. He understands that God created family and the family is foundational in Scripture and in achieving unity in the family and in the body of Jesus Christ, which is the church. And we don't have a lot of unity in the church, do we? Yeah, uh, Not yet, but working on it. We will. Satan is the father of lies and deceit, and he wants us and God to fail because the family bond is the foundation of all proper, prosperous nations. This bond promotes a safe, secure, trusting, loving, loyal relationship with society in general and conforms to our national heritage. This country was founded and established based on biblical values, principles, and precepts. <clears throat> They are not now, have never been, and will never be obsolete. Right? Amen. Yeah. Family is our and the world's common bound and bond, and without it, we face a chaotic world filled with uncertainty. We need loving, trusting, loyal, and positive family relationships and the beneficial longevity for the beneficial longevity of the human race. Right? That's what I think. And I like to read Genesis 2, 23 and 24. The man said... This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Yeah. Father God performed the first marriage when he created Eve to be a companion for Adam. When they became one flesh, they were permanently joined together. <clears throat> Jesus reaffirms this in Matthew 19, 4 through 6. I'm not going to read that. Divorce is not allowed except possibly in cases of marital infidelity. You can find that in Matthew 19, 8 and 9. What really concerns me more than anything else is the thought in many people's minds that marriage is not important. That they can just live together and separate if, if and when things don't work out. To them, marriage is just a piece of paper. A marriage performed in the presence of God is so much more than that. Amen. We take vows before God, and often we don't live up to them. Many people do. What does God think about that? Do you think we will have to take responsibility and account for that someday? Yeah. Yeah. I will let you answer that for yourself. What is even worse is when children are born into this divided home without an established, committed foundation. And this, in turn, displays a poor example for the children that often becomes generational. Just keep passing it on. Either the man, the woman, the child have an anchor. They are free to drift with no rock to stand on. Do we think that this lifestyle promotes a secure, committed lifestyle that the parents can be proud of? No, I don't think so. But, you know, a lot of people, they're so ignorant and into this, this situation that they've been in, they grew up in, and now they're in themselves. They don't have any uh, guilt about that at all. They don't. No guilt, no shame, no nothing. But uh, that is not God's plan. Amen. This is our enemy's plan, and the more chaos, confusion, insecurity, and anxiety he can create, the more he can keep us from unity and peace and love that is available through relationship with triune God. We need to reexamine and reevaluate where we stand and who we stand with. Let Jesus be your rock. Yes. I like Proverbs 22.6. I'm sure you've all heard this a hundred times. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. So that's what happens when we raise children outside of relationship with God. You trained them, now it's going to be very difficult to bring them back. It really is. That's what I mean when it took a long time to get there, it takes a, a while to get back, too. We see children being raised up generation after generation with the same learned or assumed limitations, prejudices, misunderstandings, and misconceptions as the parents. And I think it's one of the most horrible things you can do is to raise a child with some type of prejudice against people or things or places or, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's really tough. I suppose we could assume that parents just don't know better. However, in this age of easily accessible information, I believe it to be more of a question of apathy, complacency, or just unwillingness to change. 
or you could call it sloth, one of the seven deadly sins. Many parents just take it for granted and never investigate or question to discover or verify truth. We see children having children, and many assuming no responsibility for what came before or what comes after. There are many babies not wanted or cared for properly, even though they were spared the horror of abortion. Grandparents coerced into taking responsibility, and biological fathers and mothers abandoning theirs, especially the fathers. Real horrible examples these men give to other men. If the young parents do take responsibility for their children, they are often forced to take public assistance because of the financial strain. And their own life has become much more complicated with many difficult conditions and restricted opportunities regarding education and employment. And we all see that all the time, don't we? That's one of the problems. That's, that's one of the problems that our government puts a Band-Aid on. We're going to get to that. It is easy to see how discouragement can lead to many different forms of abuse and an entitlement attitude. And that's a bad attitude to get, in my opinion. Relationships suffer and expectations about a fulfilling, prosperous life almost disappear. So where was God and his unconditional love during this time? He was there all along, but no one was listening or asked or cared enough to teach or reach out to him. God is not to blame for our ignorance or inadequacy. Amen. That's a fact. Government and society in general haven't helped in most cases. They just want to put a Band-Aid on it and they hope it will remain invisible or at least obscure. They just throw a little money. I call that a Band-Aid. And services, another Band-Aid, had it to pacify, which still makes subsistence below poverty line and never addresses the root issue or problem, ever. All that stuff is just Band-Aids. Government and society in general don't consult God or his word, Bible, or provide the environment and education needed to eradicate this condition. What they actually do is enable the continuation of this behavior and foster an entitlement attitude in the recipient. I can hear people now saying or thinking that they don't have any responsibility for these people. These are people that aren't in that situation. I've heard this from multitudes of people. They say, they made their bed, now they got to lie in it. Where's the love in that? Yeah, or other just, just as ridiculous quotes. And where is the Christian conscience in all this? Do we step out in God's faith and God's authority to promote the initial change and initiate change? Do we lo look at our brothers and sisters as if looking at them through the eyes of Jesus? Some do, most don't. We must eventually step out as a united people and take responsibility for all the people of this world, not just ourselves. We are all brothers and sisters. Many people remain ignorant and uninformed. If changed and ignorant, you know, does not mean stupid. Ignorant just means you don't know better. That's all. If, yeah. If change doesn't happen soon, we will cease to exist as a free, democratic, predominantly Christian society. I'm talking about the United States. And this is not even considering that one day we will all stand before God and give an accounting. And you can read about that in Philippians 2, 1 through 11. So I'm just going to quote a couple more verses, and I'm going to get into the main message. I just want to, want to lay a foundation to what I think how, and how important I think family is. Family is, bottom line, the foundation of a free, democratic society that wants to stay free. Amen. Yeah. And family comes through God, God's definition of family. So Ecclesiastes 4.10, if one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Matthew 12, 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. And that's, and that's straight out of Scripture, and we're right in the middle of that kind of stuff right now. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to get into politics, because I, I don't think that either party has, has, the, has the answers. So, title of this message is The Church and Abortion. So Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. This is Jesus. I mean, this is God speaking. Psalms 139.13, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. This, this 
these scriptures are saying that God not only knew you, he formed you. And when we get rid of this life, what are we doing? We're, getting, we're going against what God has done and what God created. And telling him he was wrong. That's yeah. the way I look at it. Yeah. So, Jesus speaking. <clears throat> On Mark 9, 36, 37, he took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now, this lady that spoke down there, uh, she had a lot of statistics, and believe me, the North State is worse off. California is number one in the nation, right, as far as abortions per capita, you know. And they and, and California has the largest population of any state in the union. So you know, and and across the country itself, 1.3 million abortions per year, right? In the United States alone. And uh, anyway, what I like this, what I what I really liked about what this lady said. Uh, I'll give you a couple more statistics first. Shasta County, the North State itself, has three times more abortions. I forget how many counties are involved in that than the southern half, or than the state as a whole, average. But Shasta County, what you say, 10 times more? 10 times more. And I would say Trinity County is right there with them. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real horrible thing. But she says, it, when a young girl gets pregnant, she's out there running around and and, you know, partying and raising, you know what, and, and having a good time, she thinks, uh, and she gets pregnant. Her, uh, her, and I like this, her mind is like this. You know, she's living based on survival. What do I need to eat? Was that what it was? She, she's, she's just trying to survive. And, and there's, it's like animal instinct only. Okay? And she has no... Uh, uh, she doesn't sit down and try to reason things out. There's no logic involved. There's, there's nothing involved with trying to come to a, a solution to this situation. It's just survival. So, and, and yeah, and then this is the mind of a, of a girl who can sit down and reason and logically work things out and come to a resolution that is fair and just, you might say. I don't know. And, and I liked her, how she does this. But, well, you know, when you're like this, uh, and you're a young girl, and you, th and you look at, uh, you look at pro-life. Pro What's going to happen with pro-life at 16 years old? Like, and she gave one example of this 16-year-old girl whose parents didn't want her to have the kid. Boyfriend didn't want her to have the kid. What is a 16-year-old girl that's not even out of high school going to do? What is she going to do? She's going to keep a baby that nobody wants to help her with. And even if you have it and adopt it out, you know, most women get very attached to a child they've carried nine months and then give birth to. And they're always going to have a scar. They're going to have a scar if they, if they adopt it out. And they're going to have an emotional scar if they have an abortion, which they don't realize yet, but they do. But, but what looks... Huh? And physical damage to their body. Right. And, but what's... What, what looks more attractive to a pregnant girl who's living on instinct alone, just barely animal's instinct, not reasoning, what's going to look more attractive? To have an abortion and have her life start all over again? Practically brand new, she thinks. Okay? Or is she going to keep this child and all that? I asked this same lady down there after the meeting was over. I said, what alternatives do you offer to a... To a to a young girl like this, what do you tell her? And what do you have to offer her? Because if she has the abortion, she gets to stay home, gets to go to school, gets to have, I mean, life resumes just like if it was never disturbed, except for this emotional scar that is gonna come up eventually. And it's gonna, it's gonna bug her the rest of her life. And it only gets worse the older you get, because the older you get, the wiser, and, and the more understanding you get about what you did, etc., etc. and you knew you broke God's law, so anyway, that's just, that's just some of the alternatives. So when I wrote this thing uh, back in uh, 2012, uh, it, it, we were nearing a presidential election. And of course, the, one of the major points for contention is always uh, abortion. Roe versus Wade, do we keep it? Do we want to get rid of it? Uh, 
And uh, I just got down, I just put down pro-life versus pro-choice. It's always a question in an election because you have the far right, you have the far left, and the people in the middle that can be swayed maybe one way or the other. So everyone, everyone is of God and from God as described in the two preceding verses that I read and has a right to life, right? Amen. If everything we have is from God and belongs to God, when a woman's body is not hers to make, then a woman's body is not hers to make exclusive decisions about another life inside of her because this life is God's creation, just exactly like it just said in Jeremiah 1.5. I don't care what they say on pro-choice, you do not have a right to make that decision solely on your own if you're a woman. You just don't. It's just, it's, it's just simple. It's, it's scriptural. So this is especially true when a man and woman consensually come together for mutual lovemaking. Okay? When a man voluntarily relinquishes his responsibility for the child, then it becomes the woman's sole responsibility to act on behalf of the unborn child and according to God's directive. And a lot of men will just gone. They don't want it. They don't want to be around it. Not my girlfriend anymore. And I'm not even sure that's my baby. That's what a lot of them say. And they know that's a lie. They know it's a lie. It's just an excuse. just a reason to leave. So, I got a few verses I want to read. Psalms 49, 7 and 8. No man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. That's a, great, that's a great verse, yeah. One you don't hear all, very often. John 16, 21. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish of her joy that a child is born into the world. Isaiah 49, 15. This is really good. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion of the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget. That's what God said. I will not forget. So, a point that I fail to understand in the, and I'm not getting into politics, but I just have to make this reference, okay? A point I fail to understand in the conservative establishment in America that stands on less government, yet wants to abolish abortion by eliminating Roe versus Wade, which is not a bad, it's not a bad thing, by passing legislation and then by passing that legislation, they want to require enforcement of that legislation. So what did you do? You didn't, you didn't lessen any of the government. You increased the government. I mean, you took the right for abortion away, which, in, which does not have anything to do with government, except that law of Roe versus Wade, but there's no expense involved with that, unless you consider the expense that, that, they give, that the government pays to the... Uh, to those uh, pro-choice places, you know, what do you call them? I can't remember what it's called, but, uh, but anyway, they have to they have to enforce the law against abortion, and and I was around before Roe versus Wade, and so were some of you, so uh, I can tell you one thing, I know what it was like before Roe versus Wade. I know what women did because I was involved with one of them, and I know what they had to do, and I know how dangerous it was. It went underground. And that's exactly where it'll go again if, if you abolish that. And if you don't have something in place, a plan in place to an alternative that works, a permanent solution, a permanent alternative. Don't just take something away and leave a hole and leave a gap. You can't do that. Yeah. And they have to come up with a solution. The solution that the legislators are talking about now is life at conception. Absolutely lines itself with God's word. That life at conception becomes viable and becomes defensible and then therefore has an advocate. It doesn't make it a legal abortion. It makes recognition of the fact that that child is conceived to be someone who has rights, someone right. who has a life. But that's 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 good. And and I heard that. But that's not that doesn't solve any problems. It doesn't solve any problems about what I just talked about with a 16-year-old girl or 15 or 17 or I don't care what age you are. You know, if you're not out there on your own working, supporting yourself and you're relying on other people, then you're going to be relying on the government.
to give you aid. And, 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 the, and the conservative right wants to eliminate a lot of that uh, government interference. But anyway, so we know there's a lot of negative consequences. If you, if you just leave a gap, you leave a hole, and it goes back underground, which it will, I guarantee you it would. Uh, uh, just like, uh, I give you one example kind of off the books right now. You buy a pack of cigarettes right now, what's it cost you? Five, six, seven dollars for a package of 20 cigarettes. Well, guess what? They've already started, they just passed that law this year here in California. They've already started hijacking uh, truckloads of cigarettes because it's going black market, right back underground, right? Right, like everybody knew it would, just like when, you, when they had uh, prohibition. Everything goes back on the ground, and then uh, organized crime takes over. Because where there's money, there's organized crime. So what does, it, what does it do if you don't have a solution for it? If you don't have a permanent 100% solution that you know for a fact will work? That doesn't make sense or solve the problem. Also at fault is the pro-choice liberal establishment that convinces women that destroying this God-given life inside of her is, is her right and fosters fear about the consequences that keep the child, keeping the child will have in and on her life. They just, they, they drum that into them. They really do. Yeah. One of their favorite phrases is my, my body, my choice. Yeah. But they forget that that body is not their body. No. That's a completely different body. So they, yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah. Right. So you can see the, the difference between far right, far left, and neither has the answer. There, that is not the answer. The answer is in the middle somewhere. All of these options are merely band-aids to temporarily cover the real problem and avoid a more permanent solution. So before I go any further, I want to state that uh, I don't support and am not pro-choice. I also emphatically don't agree with people carelessly having babies they don't want and or can't support on their own without some form of governmental assistance. And that's exactly what happens. And, and, and I, don't think, I don't think that a person by choice, if they had a choice, if there was options and they had it, they would not take government assistance. That's a, that's just, you know, most people have a, have a well, I mean, if you, talk, if you talk about the generational families, they go from generation to generation on welfare, they probably don't have a conscience about that. But a lot of people have a conscience about taking support if they haven't had it before uh, for something like that. I mean, it's just, it's a guilt thing. But uh, if this support was temporary and we were assisting in the individual's ability to someday take care of their own responsibilities, then I could support that. I could agree to that. However, this is not usually the case, is it? No. Usually if a uh, uh, in, in some cases, if once a girl's on welfare, she has to get so much a month for her baby and so much a month because she can't work. Uh, not a lot to do during the day. She'll hook up with some other guy. And before you know it, there's another kid and more money coming for that kid. And, and I mean, it's a vicious circle. It really is a vicious circle. So it's, it's tough to step out of that. Oh, Matthew 19, 14, I like this. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And I like Mark 10, 14, 15 and Luke 18, 16, 17. They're both about the same. Uh, it's actually just a reflection of the Matthew one only with a little more depth. Let the ch little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a Little child will never enter it. That, that's, that's a statement, huh? So, any comments so far? Feel free. This is, yes, sir. Yeah, one of the things that I think even a lot of Christians haven't recognized is what Roe v. Wade did primarily was attack the idea of personhood. So it wasn't just about life. Today... Most people recognize even the child in the womb as life. Uh -huh. The question is legally whether they're a person, whether they're a person, because if they're a person, they're entitled to due process. They have rights. Yeah. And so what Roe v. Wade did was very clever because 
uh, just like they did early on with slavery, like with the Dred Scott decision where they said a slave was personal property. The child in the womb has become the personal property of the mother. Uh -huh. He has no rights of his own. But there's inconsistencies in the law because on one case, a mother gets in a car accident and loses her baby. She can sue the person who hit her for manslaughter. But at the same time, if she chooses to abort her child, even in the full term, she can do it. Yeah. And so huh. we, part of the problem, I believe, is, is going back to the church having a voice again and not being countercultural but or subcultural, but being an influence of culture. I believe it. Where we have a voice where we're telling people the truth about every life as a person. It is. And that's what you see in the Bible. And what you're, he's talking about children, whether he's talking about the unborn child in the womb. Yeah. Personhood is a sin in all of those passages. Yeah. You're right. Yes. Um, you know, this whole issue is like peeling an onion. Yeah. And through the layers of peeling that onion, there's many tears. Mm. However, I believe that the church should get to the root <coughs> cause of unplanned pregnancy or um, uh, I want to declare this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18. Uh -huh. It says, flee from sexual immorality. In other words, Flee from fornication. Teach the church needs to teach people that fornication outside of marriage is not a good thing. It produces a lot of heartache. Yeah. It's like peeling an onion in one's life. You have many shed tears for things that are in your life that say, oh, just for a moment of bliss. And believe me, sometimes it is a moment. <laughs> and, and it's not enjoyable what happens to you, and your life is scarred for life. I'm speaking out of a place of knowing what I'm talking about. Right. And there is a God who forgives. Right. There is a God who who loves you so much he gives you a second chance. Right. Many second chances. But I believe that God would want the church to stand up and say, Hey, flee from that thing called fornication. Why? Because it causes too much heartache. Yeah. See, that's to me, to me, that's one of the root uh, issues that I have with the church today in America. They don't step out, you know, in faith and in trust, unafraid of any criticism. What are they going to do? Shoot you? I mean, it's nothing like Jesus' time, where they where they crucified you. But but they won't step out and they won't stand up for things in a vocal way of, of you know where. Where people hear them and see them, not in a violent way, but yeah. But cool. even in general, they just believe the lie that the church lost its authority in our culture. Yeah. yeah. We, right. We just act like we don't have a right to tell people what to think yeah. or how to think. And also, we have to realize that Esther, you know, when it came time for her to step up, what did she say? Basically, she said, if I die, I die. Yeah. yeah. Can't threaten me with heaven, huh? Go ahead, Kent. That's right. What? The, the church has to have the proper balance. And that, the secular saying about if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything is so true. However, if we're going to, and we should, absolutely, I believe we should, teach that love is the core principle, godly love, agape love, phileo love, brotherly love, now we're coming with responsibility, and so therefore if you're going to give a message about the um, murdering of, of, a, of a child that has no voice, right. go with it with the, the fact that the love has got to be there also so that uh, a young woman in this case finds herself in this kind of situation. The church needs to stand up and say, we will help you. Yeah. We will provide that comfort level. Yeah. Right. The church needs to take the place of what government has been, and there will be that child will find a home. God, every child is, is loved by God. Uh -huh. yeah. and so therefore, the, the church has to send both sides. We are not going to stand for unfaithfulness and fornication and, and sexual morality. But on the other hand, once that's done, Christ died for the sin and rose again. So therefore, the sin is, is not overlooked. 
But let's take them the next step. Let's get them past the, the fact, okay, sin happened. Yes, we recognize that. You got that. Believe me, young girls find themselves in that position. They get it. Yeah. But the next step is the church has to say, we're going to give you a hand up. Right. Let us stand beside you, help you through the nine months, give God time to work, find a home for that baby. Right. Perhaps God will work through that, and the young man will repent. Yeah. And come back. But I think the point that Walt is trying to bring forward is the same as what the remember her name, the lady who spoke uh, in the community church, is what is the church doing before that happens? Right. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Well, and I think that's basically what... Right, but basically Ken had... <clears throat> if the church did this, like you said, 99 times out of 100, that would never happen again with that woman. Agreed. Yeah. Because if the church stood up and did what they were supposed to do, and took care of this lady, and introduced her into a relationship with the Lord... So the church needs to fall on our right. knees and repent from the fact that we've blown it. Yeah. Right. We have not right. taught right. clearly. Right. The, the Ten Commandments are not Ten Suggestions, but the love that encompasses all Ten Commandments, right. love of neighbor, love of self, will bring to place. So it's the church that takes to take responsibility. Absolutely. You know, we need to say, we, sh- we messed up. But right. We need to, don't you think also, though, that you can't necessarily start with a biblical message because the world out there doesn't recognize the authority of the Bible. True. But, but we, where we can start is with compassion and recognize, help people recognize there's more than one victim. There's at least four. Uh-huh. God's a victim, society's a victim, the child's a victim, the mother's a victim, the father's a victim. There's a lot of victims out there. And yet they're saying it's a safe, victimless yeah. procedure. So we got to confront that lie. Yeah. Go ahead, Jill. Um, I also believe that the church should offer um, compassion and kind, a, a kind, a place of, uh, you know, yes, what you did was a, it was a very bad thing, but God forgives you, and therefore we as a church can forgive you as well, and not rub your nose in it that you had an abortion. And yes, there's brokenness, and yes, there's healing that comes out of that, you know, Um uh, but you can live a life victorious after abortion. Amen. You totally can. Amen. But the woman has to forgive herself. Right. And it takes years. Yes. If it ever happens. Yeah. Years. Yeah, that's true. But my my whole point is I still believe that if we could address the issues that lead to a, a young man and woman making this decision. Ahead of time, that right there would go a long ways as far as the church is concerned addressing those issues. Uh-huh. We're not doing that, like I was saying before. We're, we're, we're pick, what we're doing is cleaning up the mess afterwards. Yeah. We're putting out the fire. Well, why allow the fire to start in the first place? Exactly. If you bring them up the way we're supposed to be bringing them up, most of the time, not always, that doesn't happen. Right. Right. Okay. <clears throat> but the compassion, right? Yeah. yeah. Showing showing people compassion and being willing to invest uh, in people's brokenness right. and not just placate them and say, "Oh, yeah, be be good and you know have a nice day. Thank you very much for your time." Or make them uh-huh. feel judged. Uh huh. That's, that's why yeah. they don't walk into a church instead. Cool. Oh, exactly. you know? Yeah. Right. And, and one one other thing to add, I think, is when we talk about the church, hopefully we're talking about all of God's people, oh, yes. body, yeah. not just the church. And that's part of the mindset we need to change. Too. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because um, when we get angry with what's happening in the culture, we need to remember they're just doing their job as quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's our job. To redefine things and, and let them see. Yeah, the just absolute. like, Absolutely. just like the lady, just like the lady was saying. She says those people that work for the pro-choice thing, they think that they're doing the right thing, and there's, and they're nice people, and there's no convincing them otherwise. They're doing the right thing. They're making the right. And they're not judging. And they're not judging. But. Yeah, I've heard it called therapeutic abortion. But to, oh, yeah. but but to get back to one other thing, I, I think it was Kenny that said it. Uh, uh, I was listening to Ravi Zacharias. You know who that is? Ravi Zacharias, this morning on the radio, and he says, he was talking about, he was over in some country, Muslim country and everything, and, and it was poor, and, 
and he was there's there's a but there is a Christian part of that too. But he says uh, he walks into a lot of these countries, not 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 just over there, but in the United States too, and he sees all the poor and the homeless and this and that, and he says, "Where is the church?" And he says, "You you have to address the need of these people before you can." introduce them into a relationship with, with God. You have to, if you don't address the need, they're never going to listen to you. Because he says, it's, 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 your, it's, it's who you are in, in Jesus, walking out Jesus within you that makes the point with them. Not saying something and doing something else. You know. So anyway. And that's to, called hypocrisy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So here's a, I'll continue with this because we've got to get rolling here. Uh, on October 31st, 2011, this was quite a while back now, about seven years, the world's population passed 7 billion. What will the, t and you've heard this, if you've talked to scientists, you've, you know what I'm talking about. What will be the planet's tipping point? And you know what that means? Mm -hmm. The tipping point is when the re Earth cannot renew itself. It can't renew its natural resources. It can't keep uh, healthy uh, atmosphere oxygen. I mean, everything that has to do with a planet being alive, it starts to die. The, the entire planet, the entire planet starts to die. It starts to go backwards. So when it can no longer sustain, support, and replenish itself, did not God give us this earth to make us responsible, responsible for it by active actively being faithful stewards of it and ourselves. Yeah, and you know what causes the planet to reach that tipping point? Population. Unchecked, uncontrolled population. At the current unchecked pace of humanity's growth, it will take all our prayers and God's power, grace, and mercy to save us from ourselves. That's what I think. If I remember correctly, and this was back then, I read this statistic, 25 children die of starvation and disease every day in Africa alone. That's just Africa. That's not including the rest of the world. This is a reflection of our current stewardship on the earth. This also asks the question, would they have been better off? Now you gotta look, remember, I'm looking at this from every angle, okay? Would they have been better off being aborted during the first several weeks after conception when death is quick and suffering minimal? Or should they be born into this world and suffer the slow, conscious death of disease, malnutrition, neglect, drug addiction, related physical and mental problems, etc., day after month after year until they're dead? And believe me, that's how they're dying. Slow, miserable, horrible death. Little kids, little, little babies and children. They have no opportunity for education or proper training or guidance to make for themselves the tools needed to provide themselves and their families a better life. It is a repetitive, vicious cycle of misery and hopelessness. This generational cycle is more and more evident in the United States as drug and alcohol abuse soars upward year after year while we continually look the other way and offer only temporary Band-Aid solutions. Hebrews 2.14 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy the power of death, and that is the devil. Yeah. Matthew 21.16 and Psalms 8.2, kind of almost similar. It said, Yes, replied Jesus, have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? I think that says a lot. You could probably get a whole message on just that alone. Uh, so in reality, abortion or not, are only symptoms of the real problem, not the problem itself. To eliminate abortion in this country and all others requires knowledge, education, understanding of God's word, and a world that needs to learn and practice Christian principles and core values, and love. We need to promote family, self-worth, and value, and self-esteem. Remember, the family is Satan's primary target for destruction, and fear is his primary weapon. And that's a fact. And that's what runs through the mind of all these young women and some men that are involved and that stick around. And even the ones that run, they're afraid, right? Fear. But I mean, if Satan can destroy the family, he can destroy the world. 
our most important defense to turn to and use is in challenging times would be our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his words. Let the Bible be your guide. And that leaves out a lot of our own responsibility. Like this woman down there was telling us, uh, none of us are going to have this problem, but we are responsible for going out there and trying to help eliminate the problem through uh, uh, education and, and trying to promote some... Uh, some understanding of what, what's going on in the world. Try to make friends with uh, younger people and, and don't put a wall up between uh, ourselves and say, well, they listen to that rap music and I don't want nothing to do with them, you know, and this, or they're loud and they're noisy and they're, they think they know it all and you know what I mean. It's just like she was saying, you have to, you have to try to relate. You have to try to step in, st walk in their shoes for a little while, what I like to call it. Get into their map of the world. So, Anything that produces lasting results, positive or negative, takes time to develop into a spontaneous, habitual action or thought. Lots of time. Our success in this could possibly take years to accomplish, but it is worth the effort. But it may not take years. You know, you just don't know until we try. Our own effort can determine this time frame, and we have God leading and guiding our efforts. This is our commission as Christian brothers and sisters. Take everything to God in prayer and do as the Holy Spirit instructs. Be the good news of Jesus Christ to a desperate world and allow Jesus to be the center of our children's lives. Let's bring heaven to earth. Mark 16, 15 and 16 says, you've, you've all heard this. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So who's going to go out and tell them? So that they, you know, I like that, that uh, verse in Romans where it says uh, uh, something about blessed are the feet of those who bring the good news. I can't remember exactly what it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. How can they hear unless someone teaches and preaches? Yeah. So in Luke 18, uh, 18 through 22, Jesus talked with a wealthy man. And you've all heard this before. In fact, this, uh, we just, uh, where did we hear this the other day? Yeah, we heard this in church. We heard, we heard this in church from that guy that came up from Bethel. Uh, he talked about that, uh, this, this uh, rich man in, in Luke uh, 18 through 22 who kept all the commandments and asked Jesus what he still had to do to inherit life uh, as, uh, as stated. Jesus said he still lacked one thing, right? To give all he had to the poor and, fo and follow him. But, and that's not saying that we have to do all that. But Jesus was just trying to make an example, right? So this guy just walked off. And I said, no, that's, can't do that, you know? Uh, this illustrates to me, along with all that other stuff the guy brought up, he brought up some good points in the sermon there. This illustrates to me that greed and self-interest have precedence in many people's lives. And we need to act decisively and with conviction and sacrifice in the resolution of a problem or a situation. Uh, the Bible states that God knew us all before we were born or formed in the womb. I know he did, and I also know he was and still is waiting for us to make an attempt, make an attempt to resolve the real problem so he can bring about the real solution. It's just like our t-shirts for our ministry. God won't drive a parked car. God is waiting for us, and he gave us authority. He gave us authority and ability and a power to do something. So, and if he already gave us all this, what more can he do except at, wait for us to act? To step out and just do something. Do something, you know? And you may fall on your face half a dozen times, but if, what's going to happen if, to you, if you get back up and start all over again? What else we, do we have to do? Uh, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train a, well, we already heard this, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. 2 Corinthians 12, 14, after all, Children should not have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. 1 John 5, 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Yeah. It is the parents' responsibility to instruct their children and be a righteous example for them to follow. Amen. Not the school, not the neighbor, not the grandparents, but they can help. Uh, not even the church. I think not even the church. 
It is the parents. That's where it's supposed to happen. That's where it's supposed to start. And the parents should be instructed by the church. Right. <laughs> yeah. Reinforced. Yeah. Yeah. Instruction, education, and proper training begins in the home by responsible parents. We need to accept our responsibilities. It is also every good Christian's duty to help the world's children whenever acceptable and possible. And there's a lot of opportunities for us to help in a nice way without calling CPS. You know what I mean? To just try to enter in in a gentle, kind, compassionate way. Relationship. When you, yeah. And don't try to don't try to be a parent to, to kids that you're not a parent to when their parents are right there because they'll just get defensive and you won't be able to do a thing after that. But there's always ways that you can be a good mentor or, a, or, or step in and, and, and be able to speak to a child who hasn't, isn't even getting it at home. He'll get it maybe from you or she, whatever it is. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 through 12. I'm just, just going to read a few more verses and then we'll be done. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. I think this talks a lot about maturity, don't you? Yes. Uh, maturing into the letting yourself a, a, a responsible child, raised by responsible parents, who thinks before they act in a proactive way instead of a reactive way, uh, this, 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 this kid will, will stop and think before they do something or before they allow something to be done to them. And, uh, and as they mature, and they'll listen to their parents, of course, if, if their parents are feeding into this, and, uh, and, then, and then as they mature, they'll see the benefit to this and be able to pass that same thing on to their children. That's, that's the generational thing we want to do. Uh, instead of what's been going on now. Job 121, I like this one, this is good. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. I just kind of threw that in there. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, do, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. Yeah, and that means uh, that probably doesn't mean a lot to most people these days out in the world and because they say this is mine and I can do whatever I want but but when you when you drop that that self centeredness and, and allow you know God to come into your life you're going to realize that you're here for you're here for more than just one reason I mean God has a purpose and a plan for everyone right but, but, but you're here to not only for your benefit, but for other people's benefit too. And you want, and you want to be seen and heard. Uh, I like to see it uh, looking, uh, seen through the eyes of Jesus. Because Jesus never did anything wrong. He never sinned. He was a perfect, the only perfect person that's ever walked the earth. We can, we can attempt that perfection, can't we? We can't be that perfection, but we can sure strive towards that perfection. Romans 12, 1 through 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And, and just to end, I just want to say that uh, I just want to stress the, the, uh, the responsibility that we all have in the world to speak to people uh, and to act when you see something that's not right, to say something, to do something in a loving, compassionate way. If you do it with love, you know, and you put, have a smile on your face, it's going to work. And, you, and, and, to, and to learn to, instead of hitting somebody over the head with the Bible, learn to, like, like I was saying before, address the need. Address the need first before you try to work in a relationship with, with, uh, with the Lord so that they will, see, uh, they will see a little bit of that, a little bit of that in you 
they'll see a little bit of Jesus in you. They'll, you know, before, before they, uh, when they come to that decision. So that's the, that's the end. Love and peace. Amen. Now, yeah. So for all you folks out there who are ready for a relationship with the Lord, and you have a little bit of an understanding, maybe you have questions and stuff like this, and maybe there's people around you that can mentor you and speak to you and 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 answer some of those questions. But if you're ready, it's very simple. It's very simple to uh, come into a relationship with the Lord. Just say, Jesus, I know I was a, I was a, I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of those sins. I am forgiven of those sins. I want you into my heart, Lord. I want you, I want Jesus to come into my heart and cleanse me and uh, wash me clean and white as snow with his blood. That's what he was on the cross for. So just uh, just say those words. Jesus, come into my heart. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. And I want you to lead me and guide me the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say, as a mother of three children... Originally, I was a mother of two children. My marriage was in trouble, serious trouble, and I found out that I was expecting my third child. It was not an easy decision, and as a matter of fact, I decided I wasn't going to have my third child. I've been a born-again Christian since I was 13 or 14 years old. If that thought can cross my mind as a Christian, it can cross the mind of anyone. So I want to encourage you today, having been through that myself, and I have a beautiful, incredible daughter who has given us another granddaughter. I would not give her up for the world, but it wasn't an easy decision. I want to encourage anybody who is struggling. We cannot assume that it's the people who don't know Jesus. If you're struggling, get help to make that decision. Go to a pastor. Go to a trusted friend. Go to someone you know who will not judge you. And that should be within the body of Christ. So I just want to encourage you that there are answers out there for every situation. And it does not have to end in death. So God bless you and thank you.